All right, greetings, I am General Waffles of the Breakfast Brigade, Militia, and I got Darkest Dungeon here. So I played Darkest Dungeon way back when it was in beta, and I really enjoyed it, and I mostly just kind of set it down and waited for the full game to come out, so I didn't really keep up with a lot of the releases on the way. Like, they released new classes, a couple new mechanics. I'm aware of most of them. But uh, I'm also, I muted the narrator just for this first tutorial area, because the narrator's really good, but... I, he's, he's talking over me. I got stuff to say. So this is just going to be a basic playthrough, and I will actually have down in the description a link to all of the characters' backstories. There's what the narrator would be saying. So, along the way you can keep up with the people that I recruit, and the people that I name, and about them. And wait for them to die horribly, or see if they actually make it to the Darkest Dungeon, though I don't expect any of the original crew to make it. So those first two areas are always the same, so I can just kind of walk through without any real harm. So, a couple of the changes. They got the corpses now, so I just can't beat on this guy anymore. I actually have to shoot the guy in the back to kill the guy in the back, or put a status effect on him. Uh, the Bulwark of Faith is now a lot better because it marks you, and I believe it did not. So originally in this game, what you did was, there were a couple strategies that kind of went through for a while. You had the strategy where you would constantly stun enemies and then heal. And then they took that out by uh, giving enemies a buff after they've been stunned. I believe it also gives your forces a buff after they've been stunned. Uh, this is so you can't actually just drag out an encounter forever and just continually heal because you can't use your healing abilities outside of battle. You have to rely on food and other commodities that you may come across. Oh, another change was the corpses. So corpses are now in the way, which can be turned off, but I really like the mechanic of having corpses. It just adds another element to the game, makes it more interesting. They can be destroyed by attacking them. Uh, they decay over time, and of course, you can uh, pull or push units to move the corpse out of there, so you don't have to worry about them. Alright, wonderful. So, you know, like I said, this is always the same. This chest is here. Oh, and it's trapped. I don't have any keys, so we open it and it'll horribly hurt me. But it didn't, because I resisted the blight. So really what I just want to do is kind of show the characters' stories as I come up with them and just kind of play through the game. Uh, Curious Warns Explorer. It's a really good game and I would suggest giving it a chance if you really like dungeon crawlers. Again, uh, this entire first part is basically a tutorial. It's always, you're always going to find a seeker and you're always going to find a, a plague doctor. Which is why I already have their backstories for them written up. So, you're, that's not your name. You are going to be... You're going to be Wilson the Crusader. You know, from a family of dukes that since lost their riches and now he's coming to the Darkest Dungeon to gain prestige for his family again. And he has kleptomania and he's God-fearing, okay. Who are you? You're not Dismos. Your names are always the same to you. You are Finn, Wilson's ex-bodyguard looking for cash money. He's a known cheat. He's got some pretty good stuff going on. You are not... I'm not even going to say that name. You're Ezekiel. Ezekiel the Plague Doctor. You know, he's had a lot of corpses in his past. Not really respected as a doctor, he is self-proclaimed as a doctor. And the Darkest Dungeon's really the only place that's really good now. Darkest Dungeon is the only place that he can actually operate on people now. Because nobody else will accept him. What do you got? And you are Clarice. Clarice the Vestal. Looking to prove that she can shine light even in the darkest reaches of the Darkest Dungeon itself. 
These are not like amazing skills, but they'll change later. Now that is something that changes their skills and their quirks. So basically, again, this map is always the same. Where you put people down there, you put them in their rows, and use their abilities. So, you know, abilities have the little blips. The little blips show where they need to be to use the ability on the left, and on the right shows you the enemies that they're available to hit. If their ability hits multiple enemies, it will be shown with a little connecting line. Uh, eventually, you, you'll be using camping skills as well. You can unlock any number of these skills once, you know, basically you make it out of the tutorial session of the game. You gotta go through like three dungeons. The very first one I just did. This one and two more. Two or one more because you need to get the trinket sales, lady. So for this, I'm gonna need six food, two torches, and no, only one shovel. One heirloom key. And I already have holy water. So in this one, you're going to need two shovels, but you're also going to find one. Because I believe this is always exactly the same. So, just entering this dungeon here, we get to see the map. And every different objective has a different thing. So this one, I need to explore 90% of rooms. It's all rooms but one. We'll just skip one of these. Uh, you can leave at any time and abandon the quest. Abandon the quest, you don't gain... You only get the loot that you acquired throughout the mission, but you get to get out with your lives. It, it's good if you fear death. But yeah, it's a torch. Yeah, he's curious. So that's just little quirk things going on, is if you have things like Kleptomaniac, that, that's what he was doing, or Curious, your players will do things separate from you. They all talk to each other at times, and they'll do things. Kleptomaniac is awful and annoying because they'll just steal stuff. But sometimes you don't want to mess with everything, because everything can give you a possible reward, but some things it's a lot worse. Oh, no enemies in the back. It's a lot worse chance. Like you come across an Iron Maiden, for example. An Iron Maiden isn't going to give you the same benefits on average as say like you know a chest or like a backpack and vice versa you know. so sometimes characters will mess with stuff you didn't want them to some things you need items to this is unlocked so don't need a key if you use an item there's a shovel if you use an item to uh, check to try to interact with another item you'll lose it here it just tells you that you can use it but like, if you come across tainted holy sites, you can use holy water. I don't know all the interactions, or most of them, in fact. I just know a few, so I can probably just stun her. Yeah, this brings me to another thing is the torchlight. So, the torchlight, she just made it go down with her ability. This ability makes torchlight go up slightly. Torchlight is a very important mechanic of this game. The lower that is, the harder things become, and the more loot you get, and more importantly, the more crits you have. Or the more likely you are to get crits. That's just a shuffle. Okay. The more likely you are to get crits on enemies. And a strategy that was working for a while was that you took two of the barbarians, a jester, and a highwayman, and you would use all of their AoE abilities to just wipe out entire groups of enemies before they had a chance. And you just run highlight and there was really no actual risk. This has since been changed out a little bit since now these abilities have been just balanced. Nothing too special or fancy about it. But I mentioned earlier I wanted to do some low light runs because I, especially early on, Later on, it can get dangerous to run low light in the harder dungeons, but in these early dungeons, people are rather replaceable. And I'll talk about that more once we get to town. But these earlier dungeons don't matter so much for survival as they do for finding loot to upgrade your stuff. And that's what I'm going to be focused on. And there he goes, kleptomaniac -ing. Damn it, Wilson. Oh, and he took a really good item. 
Those items are just gone. Yeah, horrible things happening up here, but also more loot. And there's a shrine. Surprised. Yeah, I could move my guys back into proper positions. Yeah, there's no way you're gonna bleed. But using a movement action also takes up your entire turn. Finish him. So you cannot move and use an ability. It just skips your turn. It's better than using past turn, which I've had to use on very rare occasions. Yeah, I hit him. On very rare occasions, I've actually had to use that, and it just incurs a stress penalty, so if you can, it's better to move. But even better, it's good to have movement-related abilities. And nobody in the starting party has them. Like, Vestal and the Plague Doctor don't have them at all. So, I'm just going to Bulwark of Faith to mark me up. So, people like the Jester especially are very good at manipulating Marching Order. They have many abilities like Finale, Solo, Lunging Strike, I believe, or that could be another class. But anyway, they have a lot of abilities that will attack and move their position in the party. So, it's like I attack here, and then I would go back. That's the idea. Some abilities you move forward when you attack. The Jester specifically has... Oh, that's really fast. Jester specifically has the ability to... Uh, go all the way to the back from the front, and all the way to the front from the back. With Solo and Finale. Okay, you just get out of there. So here, it put my guy on Death's Door. I went down to zero HP, and he's still alive. Let's heal him up, because Death's Door is very awful. So instead of just outright dying like you would in most games, you instead get on this Death's Door, and it drastically lowers your stats and your abilities. And if we just check, everyone has a chance to resist getting hit. Once you get hit by somebody, you have to re... When you're at zero, you have to resist the damage to kill you. Now that we're out of combat, I can just switch these right back around. But I cannot use my Vestal's healing outside of combat. And here we got this... Oh, holy fountain. Holy water. I meant to do that with Mr. Plague Doctor. So that's just something to think about is, you know, your placement in the party. And eventually you can... This also works with... That's unfortunate. This also works with the enemies. Some enemies... Some enemies will actually not be able to do very good attacks or very effective attacks from the front as they would in the back and vice versa. I would really like you to stop doing things on your own. And they always talk. Unless they're actually going crazy... They, them talking is not usually bad. So, I mentioned it's not bad to kind of let people die, and I very much... Ooh, that's new. Death Door Recovery. So when you get on Death's Door, there is a penalty for the rest of the quest. That's very bad. I'm glad that they added it, because being on Death's Door used to not matter too much. Yep, hunger events happen when you're in the dungeon. Uh, camping events, which come later. But then let's get to the very crux of what makes this so unique and special. Not so much unique to the entirety of like Lovecraftian type of games, but unique to dungeon crawlers, mostly. It adds a stress component. Everybody has stress, as you can see, out of 200. When you reach 200 stress, your max stress, you will go through a moment where your character will have to... They'll either break mentally and cause them to go insane, or they will actually uh, become a hero, like a heroic figure, and they'll lose all their stress immediately. Heroic figures kind of just... I don't know if that's like a proper name. Uh, it will happen. It, especially low light runs, it happens a lot. I would just rather you die. Uh, zealous accusations can take them out. So that's good. When they actually become heroic, 
They will say encouraging things to the party, lowering their stress. Their stats will be buffed. You know, it's a good situation for everybody. And also, I believe it has a higher chance of actually pushing people to that heroic state rather than the insanity state. So the insanity state is the exact opposite. You remain at 200 stress. And basically you will get some sort of insanity quirk. You will get something that will be like... Oh, that's real good. You'll get something that'll be like, oh, you do less damage, you're less likely to hit. Uh, you'll become selfish and you refuse to do the work and you want your party to do it, etc, etc. While in the state, you will do, you will refuse to do things at times, but other times you will uh, yell and scream things that will upset the other party members, adding to their stress. And this can cause a horrible chain reaction with one person breaking, then the next, that person causing another person to break, and so on and so forth. That's a very bad situation to end up in. Just take him out. Now, stress, unlike damage, is permanent. Once you leave a quest... Once you leave a quest, you will be granted your health back for the next quest. When you are... Uh, when you exit a quest with stress, that stress stays over and you need to cure it. Just take him down. I... probably... Yeah, he's dead. So, we'll just... Randomly use abilities. So stress stays throughout you all the time. This is why you bring the key. There's a chest. There's almost always a chest somewhere. And now we can exit. We could explore that last room, but I already know there's nothing important in it. Here you get your treasure for anything that you found and your heirlooms. Heirlooms are usually more important. Some of them more important than others. Crests are fairly common and found everywhere. Busts are usually found in the Warrens, where we just were. And when you level up, you get these quirks. Some good, some bad. Apparently all bad. Quick reflexes for two speed. Hates beasts, so he removes stress damage versus beasts and does more damage versus beasts. Really good, actually. But he has a minus 5% virtue chance because he's mercurial. He got Kleptomaniac, which we already saw. They just steal things at random. And Zoophobia, more damaging. Stress damage against beasts. So now we can return the town. And I'll close that. Now that we return the town, you can see there are no health bars. They're just fully healed. Okay. Apparently, uh, and these are just harder to get rid of than the other ones if they have a little skull by them. That's about the gist of what I got from that. So their health is good, but their stress is not as good. If I were to embark on another quest to the ruins, I would, you know, I'd take them and it would take stressed out people there. They have a much higher likelihood of breaking. So what you gotta do is go to places like the Abbey. This offers, you know, worship, religious style, stress relief. Alternatively, there's also the tavern. The tavern offers stress relief from the bar, gambling, and brothel. The caretaker always occupies one spot, I believe at random. It could be either in the tavern or in the abbey, but he always occupies one slot. So if upgrading is very good, especially since some people have quirks like Gnome Cheat. He's not allowed to gamble in town. Some make it so you can only gamble to relieve stress, or only pray, or only blah blah blah. And these all incur a little penalty of their own. When you put people in here, sometimes horrible things will happen, sometimes good things will happen, but usually horrible things. Like they'll just get rid of your trinkets because they gambled them away. And then every time after a quest, that's a new class I wasn't prepared for, you'll get new people in from Stagecoach. Coming in from the stagecoach, you can just drag them over. You don't have to, but usually having more people is better, as long as you're not... Because you can just discard them at any time. But they're free, and you can upgrade the stagecoach, which I will, to offer more people. 
upgrading the stagecoach, however, uses deeds. Deeds are incredibly valuable. Crests, not so much. Crests are, however, used to upgrade, like, everything else. So here, you got the guild, blacksmith, and the nomad wagon. Once you do more quests, these just unlock really quickly. This way you can get your skills unlocked. This unlocks better equipment. It's not that exciting. This lets you buy and sell trinkets, which are no longer cupcake boxes. Either way, that's where I'm going to end this for today. Next video will not be as explanatory. But this is the Darkest Dungeon at the Darkest Breakfast House Estate. I've been General Waffles of the Breakfast Brigade. Till next time.